Oh, uh, yeah. Are you ready to get into the way this morning? I am too. We have been doing a series for the last three weeks called Devotion. And Miss Jane, I am sorry. I am uh, going to do our prophecy update. Now I remember what I was going to announce, but forget it. Um, but I didn't put the graphic on there uh, in uh, easy worship for you. It's on the desktop if you grab Devotion and drag it over to easy worship. But if not, don't worry about it. Um, you'll see it in the um, archive uh, sermon footage on the website or in uh, YouTube or Facebook. Uh, or not Facebook, but YouTube. I do edit and put a sermon video on there. Um, but we're going to talk to you today about devotion. The last few weeks we've been talking about devotion of um, and Job and Daniel and Noah. And uh, today, and those three were pointed out by the prophet Ezekiel, actually pointed out by God to the prophet Ezekiel, the laughs of devotion impress God. And we want to live lives of devotion that impress God. Who wants to live that kind of life? Who wants to? He knows us all. But who wants to stand out to where God can look at another believer and say, Have you looked at them? Have you seen their life? Um, they're an example. The Apostle Paul, in the, and I don't have this as a scripture reference in the sermon, but in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, said, Be followers. The King James says, Be imitators. Be followers of me as I also am of Jesus Christ. I want that to be all of our testimony as a people of God, people of the Word, people who are devoted and living a relationship and not just practicing a religion, um, but that can get God to say, look at Carolyn. Look at the life she's living. Follow her example. Look at Brenda and follow that lead. You can learn from her. Watch Brenda and grow. You know, I want it to be that way. Levi, a man of God, setting an example for others. He's somebody that you can respect and follow. That's the way God wants it to be. So we're going to continue the devotion series. Even though there's three that God mentioned in Ezekiel um, and dealt with, and we're going to move on to one that is one of the most extraordinary characters in the Bible, and his name is Joseph. Not Joseph, the, uh, the earthly um, father of Jesus, um, but Joseph in the Old Testament. And uh, in Jacob, you know, one of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and then Jacob. Jacob, we know his name was changed to Israel. And, um, and so that's where we get Israel from. Israel and Jacob are one and the same. And like uh, Peter was named Simon, but Jesus called him Peter. Uh, Jacob was named by God Israel. And so those are the patriarchs, the head of the Jewish, third Jewish religion, the Jewish ethnic people. You can be a religious Jew and you can be a Jew by blood. You know, that's two different things. Um, preferably both, and, and the religious side, the spiritual side, would be one that accepts the Messiah, Jesus Christ. They're known as Messianic Jews. Rather, accept the Lord now than in the future. Those that attended prophecy update know what I'm talking about. But Jacob, the third in line of the three patriarchs we look at, Abraham, the patriarch of the Jewish people, and then Isaac, and then Jacob, which is named Israel. Um, Joseph is the son of Jacob. And at the time he was born, he was the youngest son of Jacob after uh, two maid servants and uh, a sister uh, that married him. And then uh, um, maid servants are uh, getting an action of having babies. You know, it was a different day back then, not an endorsement, but a different day. But his beloved uh, Rachel never had a baby um, in the early days. And so there's Eleven brothers <laughs> coming around, and and, uh, and, um, and then God blesses Rachel, and she has Joseph, and boy did Jacob love Joseph, youngest son at that point, not his youngest son in the end, but his youngest son at that point, and um, the son of his beloved Rachel, and that's Joseph. And we can learn one thing of Ruby because he just um, showed that love 
in that preferential treatment. And for those of us that have young children, it's good to, to hear. Not that I think you do from what I've seen. Um, the grandparents listen to this too. Sharing the preference of one child over another can create great, great problems. And it's not good. God doesn't do that with us. He may have pulled it out and said, not them, but he doesn't leave any of us more than any other. And he doesn't do anything uh, that shows that he's, he caters to us. We may see more manifested blessing of God in our life because of our yielding to him, but that's us, not him. He freely blesses and uses us all and is trying to pull us all in, grow us all in, and, uh, and bless us all. Amen. So let me give you a summary of Joseph's life, and then I'm going to get into some scripture as we've done before. <clears throat> and the reason why I'm going to give you a summary is because from Genesis chapter 37 all the way to Genesis 50. There's only 50 chapters in Genesis, and 13, just over a quarter of the chapter of the entire book of beginnings, which expands a lot, covers the life of Joseph. And you can even go back a little bit where he's, you know, about down and stuff. But 37 is really where we pick up his life. And goes all the way to 50. That's extraordinary in and of itself. And one of the reasons why I wanted to choose him next. But, um, but because I didn't have time to go through all of this, I could take weeks on the life of Joseph. Many sermons of different aspects of his life. Um, and there's some deadly things, but we're going to bring out some stuff in the area of devotion, just like we did with Daniel and, uh, and um, uh, uh, Job. And so let me just give you the highlights, because most everybody knows the story of Joseph. Um, plays have been done, movies have been done. Anybody ever go to the, to the site and say anything later and see Joseph? You know, and his many colored coat and all of that, you know, the story. And one of the great uh, stories of the Bible, and people become aware of that. And so let me just kind of highlight it. And if you want to remember and everything exactly, a lot of us will ring the bell and become familiar to you as we go over his life. And then we're going to zero in on some things. Number one, Joseph, uh, these are some highlights, not everything, but some bullet points that I made. Joseph was loved by his father. Joseph was hated by his brothers because of their own preference. <laughs> you know, this wasn't his personality, it's, it's they were jealous. And again, just a free line. So I popped those in there. Joseph had a prophetic dream of greatness. And we will see that that made his brothers hate him even more because he told his brothers the dream and the dream will be interpreted, and the brothers could even interpret it, because he said, "My there was the sheaves, and and um, <laughs> and there were the eleven sheaves, and then the eleven sheaves bowed down to my sheaf. Your sheaves bow down to my sheaf. So he's saying, um, I will be greater than you, and one day you'll bow down before me. Well, you may already hate him. That didn't help any. And so he tells him the dream, and, and of course. Uh, they made him hate him even more. So what was the result? Um, Joseph was cast out and left to die by his brothers. If you remember, they took him out. They took his coat of many colors off. Um, they threw him into a pit, and they were going to let him starve to death or die of dehydration and starve. He'd, he'd die of dehydration first, but, but die. And he was going to be back in a, in a pit. They took the coat of many colors, slew an animal, put the blood on it, and told they lied to their father and said he was slain. He was killed by an animal. But the eldest brother, not knowing his blood on his, on his hands, secretly was going to go in the middle of the night and put a rope down, let Joseph out, and let him get, get out of there. But the younger brothers, before Reuben could do that, um, ended up uh, having a, a caravan of uh, people led by someone who was an Ishmaelite, you know, a son of Ishmael. And you had this contention between, you know, 
uh, gene and Ed that was created because of Abraham's mistake. And so you had Isaac and Ishmael. This is a son of Ishmael. So they decided, hey, why don't we just let him buy? Let's sell him on this and make some money off of this. And we still get rid of him. Not the greatest character. We're not talking about their devotion today. They were not really devotion in themselves, it was to themselves. It speaks of the selfishness of the same nature. But they were pulling out before Reuben could set him free, and he sold him to the Ishmaelite, who then goes to Egypt and then sells him into slavery for a prophet to Potiphar, an Egyptian uh, uh, officer and influence, uh, of great influence. So he was left, cast out like the dog, then he sold by the brothers, uh, and then he sold again as a slave in Egypt. Most of you know the story of Potiphar's wife trying to uh, get intimate with Joseph over and over again, and Joseph um, refuses to do that, so she falsely accuses him of rape, and he is now cast into prison. So he goes from being thrown into a pit, left to die, sold into slavery, and now falsely accused and sent to prison. In prison, Joseph, uh, um, there's an interpretation of a couple dreams that a couple of the officers of Pharaoh's court, his baker and his cupbearer, um, uh, got on his bad side. They were cast into prison, and uh, they each had a dream. And Joseph interpreted the dreams, and he interpreted them accurately, telling the, um, the um, baker that he would, he would die, long story short, and the company that he would be restored to his official position um, at Pharaoh's table. And um, when he told him, when you go, you put in a good rule, I'm innocent. You know, me and my innocent project. <laughs> Get out there and let him know about me so I can be set free. Well, the dream's fulfilled. The cupbearer's put back into authority, released from prison. The baker is executed. And, um, he forgets Joseph. So now, all the other things that happen, and now he's forgotten. Had hope, and then forgotten. I'm mean, getting some tough blows in his life. I want you to get that um, uh, in, in our teaching today of his devotion, because it's going to make it stand out even more. Is it is still there before the next thing happened of note. And, and, and like the other three characters, there's certain specific teaching that we normally do, and, and one of them is uh, Joseph, I teach his excellence and, and God's blessing and all, and we've taught that over the years. I'm bringing out some devotion in the face of the trials and the difficulty because I'm focused on devotion, and so like the other three, I'm giving you some other insight into it, and not talking about how he was promoted. And he was really you couldn't keep him down because he was a child of God and he just he would rise up no matter how rough the circumstance was. God was with him. But that's not the, 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 the gist of today's emphasis. Okay, so Pharaoh has a dream. Nobody can interpret it. The cup mirror says, Oh, what did I do? I forgot. I don't know if you forgot. Or if he thought, why? Just getting out of prison. Um, and the father was mad at me and threw me in prison and he just killed the baker. Why do I want to make any waves? <laughs> you know, I think maybe I ought to keep my head down and just do my job. I don't know what the motivation uh, was or if it was just forgetting. I kind of don't think you forget when you get put back and it's the fulfillment of a dream. And you see the other guy executed, just like the fulfillment of that dream was. I don't think you forget about that. So I think there was another motivation, in my opinion. <laughs> so he was out there, and Joseph was out there by this guy, but then when the Pharaoh has a dream, and no one can interpret, he says, oh, there's a guy I know. Because Pharaoh's looking for somebody. Now it's changed. Now I have an opportunity to say, well, Pharaoh, I know someone who can interpret. Thank God it happened, but what a dirty deal. Now that it's to his advantage, he tells Pharaoh about Joseph. 
Does that not sound like life about some of our experiences with co-workers and, and managers and our places of business and the uh, family dynamics at times and other things in life and just uh, for the students and you know just everything in life? We see those kind of things happen, don't we? People putting their interest ahead of others. Joseph certainly experienced that. But now that the baker knows, hey, I can get you, somebody can interpret the dream, which is only going to make me look good. And he says it in a kind of a remark. Oh, yeah, I, I just forgot what it was. And he tells him. So at least two years has went by, but then Joseph went by. So they said he was in prison at least two years, if not more. Two years is not very impressive. All right. So, Joseph comes and interprets the dream, and he is made um, immediately upon the interpretation and the wisdom of advice based on the interpretation to Pharaoh. He's made the governor of all of Egypt. Talk about going from the gutter to the, to the palace, from the bottom to the top, only second to Pharaoh in power. He manages Egypt wisely during seven years of prosperity, um, giving a 20% tax to take in uh, 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 from the abundance of Egypt. And then he continues to rise, Egypt, uh, wisely manage Egypt during the seven years of famine. It was uh, the interpretation of Pharaoh's dream of 14 years. And he um, and wisely manages them, having enough food to provide for Egypt and even other nations that come, where he sells that food and when they run out of money, he, he trades it for their livestock and when they run out of livestock, he trades it for their land and family becomes the owner of basically all, pretty much everything in Egypt. He, he uh, kept everyone alive, which was the most important thing, and at the same time was able to um, have them. So Pharaoh's now able to lease everything, and Joseph's leadership, um, because he's the one who did the leases, had just a simple 20% of whatever you grow as Pharaoh's. So he continued that practice, and then after the seven years of famine, I'm going. Don't you wish we only paid 20% taxes? <laughs> Not a bad deal. Joseph's a good guy. Fair guy and wise guy. We say this. And, um, and then we know that the, the, the famine hit his home, his people hard, and so his brothers come to Egypt to buy food, and they don't know Joseph. He looks very different, sounds really different, and Joseph recognizes them. I can't get into the details, that's not what it's about today, but um, we're going to see in our text he forgives them. And, uh, and, and that's what's important for the summary. He forgives them. He brings his family, which is those brothers and their, their, their wives and their children and their flocks and anything. His father, his mother's died, um, but his father and all that he has all to Egypt to, to live and be provided for. And um, oh, he reveals himself to his brothers before, and there's a, a drama to it. Let me tell you, read the story of Joseph in Genesis 37 through 50. Read it. But he reveals himself to his brothers and forgives them, uh, leaves his family to Egypt, and then he prophesies in his death, or in, 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 in painting death, the, the return of the Israelites that would grow hundreds of years later. He prophesies something's going to happen 400 years later, and he he says, take my bones with you when you go, when you leave Egypt. And that was accurately fulfilled as well. So an extraordinary life, wouldn't you say? And that's just some bullet point highlights. Let's get into some scripture um, and sum it up. Uh, we're going to show you that, um, that knowing that I gave you this summary and the betrayal of his brothers, Throwing him in a pit to live and die miserably. We say that to die of thirst is really unpleasant. And you didn't have water, and you certainly didn't have food, but you die of thirst before you die of water. They say you can last three to five days, um, not much more than that at max. 
without water. You can go a couple weeks or more, uh, several weeks or more without food, but not water. And so and it's unpleasant. I haven't, I haven't died that way, so I wouldn't know. Um, but Lisa's got me feeling it. No, uh, no, she's. I, I'm supposed to drink a lot of water. I'm drinking the water, but the the, the, the lack of of food on the level that it was is, is different. And um, you know, it's just a matter I have to get used to. And everybody says when you start this, you got to get used to it. And we're still getting used to it. Karen, I'm, I'm just miserable. So no, I'm not quite miserable, but uh, but I'm missing some stuff. <laughs> she says I don't care. You, you be healthy. She wants me to be healthy. So, you know, and so does my wife and my kids, and that's smart. And we decided to do this before we talked to the doctor anyway, so this is good. Meet me, Nikki. Work on. Got a kid that's going to be seeing me in high school. I'm going to be there for him. So, here we are in Genesis 45, verse uh, 4, and we're going to read through verse 12, where we see Joseph's perspective on what his brothers had done to him. And I'm going to tell you it's extraordinary. We're going to read that, uh, chapter 45, and then we're going to go to chapter 50. Joseph said to his brothers, Please come near to me, so they came near. Now, now he knows who they are, but they don't know who he is. This is when they went for food. And he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But now, therefore, listen to this. Do not, therefore, be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. Is your mouth dropping right there? He is only second to Pharaoh. Who Pharaoh is that who won everything. So he's really, practically speaking, the most powerful man on earth. He says, I'm the one you sold into slavery. And if it wasn't for that, you let me for that, sold me into slavery. And if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't have ended up in prison. And women say, so get ready, guys. The way you have a new life for you. Now, yeah, he says immediately, but, but just a minute, I'm Joseph, your brother. He knows that they're probably ready to pass out. But he says, but now, do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves. He didn't tell about his anger toward them. He says, don't be angry with yourselves. Because you saw me here. Because there's some for God sent me before you to preserve life. See, I see God's hand in this to preserve life. The life of Pharaoh and the Egyptians, but also the life of other people in other nations, including yours and your fathers and the people that are part of my Jewish relatives and co-citizens. Isn't that amazing? For these two years of famine, and that's sort of the point that they made, they ran out of food after two years. These two years of famine have been in the land, and there's still five years in which they will be neither plowing nor harvesting. Again, listen to verse 7. God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth. That we will have children and grandchildren and great grandchildren and a wife and a a heritage. To, and to save your lives by a great deliverance. It took this for that to be able to happen. Is that amazing to you? If it's not, go back and read it slower. Meditate on it and let the Holy Spirit minister to you. Because I just get in awe every time. Verse 8, so now it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh, and lord of all his house, and ruler throughout all of the land of Egypt. Verse 9, hurry up and go to my father and say to him, this says, says your son Joseph. <laughs> he thinks it's bad. God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down and me. Do not tell Oh, tell him, baby, I can't wait to see you. I'm busy here. Come to me as fast as you can. I'm going to hug your neck. I miss you, Daddy. 
You shall dwell in the land of Goshen, and you shall be lonely. You and your children, your children's children, your flocks and your herds, all that you have, including, because we didn't tell you the details of the story, my little brother that came after me that I didn't even know about Benjamin. And he was seen alone, and it was 10, and then Joseph was the 11th, and then, of course, Benjamin. So, correction. Then I will provide for you, lest you and your household and all that you have come to poverty, for there are still five years of famine. See, this is God's way to provide a verse throughout the Bible. Throughout the Bible, you know, in the life of Abraham, and, and how he uh, ended up going to war because of him being overtaken, and he, he defeated the, the people that had, had uh, the, the tribe that had overtaken him. And, Taken all of his possession and his wife and everything, and he defeated them, and he took the spoils of all that they had, and then uh, it's kids that it comes on the scene, and he did And um, and uh, and he, he worships and presents the tithe of all that to Melchizedek. You see, um, these things throughout the scripture uh, that God provides. He blessed Abraham so abundantly, and gave Abraham gave out of his provision. Therefore, I would provide that you uh, will not come to poverty because of five years of famine. And in verse 12, Behold, your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin um, uh, see that this is my mouth that speaks to you. I'm looking forward to meeting my brother Benjamin. And in chapter 50, verse 18, we see, we see this heart once again, this extraordinary thing, which is what I want to bring about, because when you have a devotion to God, you can see the hand of God and have an ability when you, when you look at things through the eyes of God, and with faith in God, we you can see the providence of God and have an ability to forgive when people just, that's just not the way people are in this world. It's one of the reasons why Jesus said, uh, people will know you are my disciples because you love people. I keep my commandments, of course, but that's something. So, chapter 50, verse 18, when his brothers also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we your servants. And it all comes back. And I remember John, I remember ten sheaves bowing down before the eleventh sheaf, Joseph's. It was fulfilled. Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. Again, just same response as he did back in the previous passage. Do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? It's not my place to judge you. Then he says, mine says the Lord, I will open. Hey, I just trust God so much, I just leave these things into his hand. I have no ill will to, to anyone. I am the enemy of my own, no one is my enemy. I may be the enemy to others, to, in my mind, but I have no enemies in my own heart or mind. Isn't this an extraordinary person? Because of his devotion. So Joseph said to them, don't be afraid that I am the place of God, but as for you, you meant evil against me. No, I'm not, I'm not excusing what you do. You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. Can you remind you of Romans 8, 28, doesn't it? Well, we'll read it in a few moments. Um, and we to bring it about as it is to this day to save many people alive. See, he saw the bigger picture. We all have detours in our life. We all get knocked down sometimes. And life can be hard. And sometimes, if you don't know any better, it can feel like God even let you down. Lisa accurately said, people will let you down. God will never let you down. And Joseph, and she had no idea I'm preaching this, but Joseph, he had that revelation. But sometimes, we feel like, God, why have you allowed this? To happen. Why are you? And he is God. And he has a bigger picture. We're looking, they're putting this puzzle together, and it's a detective combination mystery thing, and it, she, she just loves it. And it's a tough puzzle. And we're working it. And we, we have to, because they don't, you know, it's hard to see those little pieces. And yet when you focus on that, where it goes in the bigger picture, that every piece is important. A puzzle with pieces missing is not attractive. It looks unfinished. But to even get to that point where you start to see the picture is a challenge. And you see, that's how it's still in our life. We don't see the big picture. We don't know it all. And we feel like God's let us down. But guess what? Just like she said, 
He has not let us down. Joseph had that revelation because he was devoted to his heavenly father. Because he knew his heavenly father. He knew the nature of his heavenly father. And because he knew that, he trusted him and knew that God was able to turn it for good. And Joseph was able to see that through it all. And that's why he never in his life do you see him moaning uh, and complaining, turning away from God and saying, Forget it, I'm done with you. You've let me down. He knew God didn't let him down. He knew that this was a tough break of life in a broken, fallen world, but that God was reliable. God was dependable. God was trustworthy. And to stay focused on him, um, that God would see him through life. And because of that, we can see, even in the journey, God blessing him in the midst of those trials. I hope you're being encouraged by the Word of God today. Not my preaching, the Word of God today. So, um, so God meant it for good to bring about this day to save many people alive. He's seen the big picture. Now therefore, again, he tells him, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and the little ones and comfort them. And he spoke kindly to them. <laughs> how many of us have meditated at times in our lives on how we can get back at somebody? Or how do like, we don't figure out our plan on how to get back in. Remember that first Columbo? That guy was, he was a manipulator the way he wanted to get his wife and take her out. Maybe we don't think, okay, I'm going to plan it, but we think of ways that things that could happen to them. Take the right when we see that they have tough things happen in their life and say, that is serving right. You know, the world has a saying that I can't repeat in our company here and on this tape. Is a man of God? But it's karma is something. That's kind of the way the world you know, they vanish in that. Yeah, karma, it's, it's this thing. See, that's the way the world thinks and acts. They even plots to revenge themselves. Not, 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 not in God's kingdom. And Joseph devoted to God to that. So, real quickly, I want to read um, verse 18, 19, and 20 uh, to you. Um, I'll look at each verse and then give you a reference verse to, to look at it and see another scripture that can relate to that. It says he, he, verse 18, Then his brothers also went and fell down before his face, and they said, The Lord were your servants. Remember that? Listen to Genesis 37, 55 through 8. Again, we mentioned it. Now Joseph had a dream, and he told it to his brothers. They wanted to live in there. So he said to them, Please hear the dream which I have dreamed. They will be binding sheep in the field, and behold, my sheep arose. And also stood up right. And the worship chiefs stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brother said to him, Shall we indeed believe this? Or shall we indeed have dominion over this? And he hated him even more for the dreams and his words which he sought fulfilled. Joseph, verse 19, said to them, Do not be afraid, for I am I in the place of God. And as I mentioned, Roman said, 1219 says, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. I'm just because we're wrapping it up, going to ask you a question. How many of you have ever just let, let go, let God, and seen the Lord vindicate you, maybe days, weeks, months, or even years later? Pretty much everybody will hear that, don't we? So the is where they live, and it comes out of being devoted to God. If we're not feeding our flesh and our sin nature, we're not keeping our eyes on Jesus, and we're meditating on God's word, we can have a life of devotion. We can be like a Joseph, a uh, Daniel, a uh, Jonah, a Maria, brother, and a uh, Job. And, and there we see Joseph. Okay, so verse uh, 20. But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. I'm going to keep many people alive. This is Romans 8 28. I'm going to read this to you from the Amplified uh, Classic version. There's a new Amplified version, but this is the original Amplified Classic that really brings out the Hebrew and the Greek. We are assured in there that God, being a partner in their labor, all things work together and are fitting into a plan for good. And for those uh, who love God and are calling according to his design and purpose. 
When you know you're a child of God, he has a plan. No matter what's happening in your life, and you be like Joseph and say, I don't get it, Lord, I don't understand it, but I know you have a plan. You know, I guess it, you, you don't see that in the quote from Joseph, but isn't that reflective of his attitude in his life? You can almost hear him saying that every day. Waking up, oh, I've been proven still. I don't understand it, Lord, but I know you have a plan. I trust you, sir. Trust in the Lord. With all your heart, don't lean to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. Proverbs 3, verse 4 and 5. And then, um, uh, verse number 21, Now therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you in your good advice, and you comforted them and spoke to them. Not only will I forgive you, but I'm going to bless you and provide for you. Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 through 45. You have heard that it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. And this is one of those ones where I said, Brie, you can put in these two words in order. Let me just say this for help. In order that you may be the sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. Because Joseph trusted God and was able to understand God's good picture and to forgive his brothers. That's the life of devotion. So I'm going to lay the faith preach here and I'd love to point out how God blessed Joseph throughout his journey in his life and would cause promotion to come. Promotion comes from God. It's another message for another time. Today we talked about the devotion of Mark Joseph, and we see that that produced an extraordinary ability to see God's big picture and to be able to forgive things that I mean, great wrongs that were done to him. So rather than respond with hate and anger, Joseph was able to respond with love and forgiveness, being a, not only love and forgiveness, but also to be a blessing to those who have done him wrong. And then, uh, closing, Joseph expressed complete faith in the promises concerning the land of Canaan when he spoke uh, of his departure uh, from Egypt centuries before. Uh, another thing, just an extra bonus. Um, Hebrews 11.22, it says, first, by, by faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the departure of the children of Israel and gave instructions concerning his birth. That's part of the Hebrews, Hall of, what we call the Hall of Fame of Faith. He was a loving, um, notable people of faith. And, um, and, and, and something that stood out to the Hebrew writer was that Joseph, by faith, saw the people of Israel. This was before they even became slaves. He and his family just kept bearing the children, and, and with the stars of the sky and the sand of the sea, that all of a sudden our future family is like, hey, they're going to they're going to, us. Uh, they're, they're going to overtake us. So they made them slaves. <laughs> they made a change. And for 400 years they were slaves. And Joseph saw when he was ready to die, I am dying. Remember to take my bones when you go out of this land of Egypt to the land of our fathers. Genesis 15, verse 22 to 26. Joseph dwelt in Egypt in his father's household, and Joseph lived 110 years. Joseph saw Ephraim's children to the third generation, so, uh, so we got to see great great grandchildren. The children of Machu, the sons of Manasseh, were also bowed upon Joseph's knees. What a blessing and what a picture in the end. Joseph said to his brethren, I am dying, but God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land to the land which he swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. See, God's going to rescue you. He's going to bring you out. We need to be free to go at that time. But that was, that was not what was going. And, and Joseph talked about having a big picture because he was so devoted to God, he could receive from the Spirit even prophetic visions and dreams and the ability to interpret. And uh, verse 26, Joseph died being 120 years old. They embalmed him and he was put in a coffin in Egypt and that was for 400 years. And when you read the book of Exodus, they took the uh, sarcophagus of Joseph and they took it to the promised land. And it's something. Notable quotes. Remind me if I give you just notable quotes. I'll just give you the reference. 
these are some radical quotes that talk about Joseph's devotion. How then can this great how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? That was when Potiphar's wife wanted him to sleep with her. It would have been easy to do, just like, hey, well, she might have been beautiful. He might have thought physically, hey, this is not a bad deal. But now he said, I can't sin against Potiphar and I can't sin, I can't betray Potiphar and I can't sin against God. That's devotion. Um, I'm not going to elaborate, but we didn't talk about that story a whole lot. Uh, another one, Father said to his servants, can we find such a one of this alone who is the Spirit of God? That speaks of his devotion. That was when he interpreted Pharaoh's dream. Do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? We just all read that. And then, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. These quotes from the book of Genesis really speak of a person's life of devotion by the name of Joseph. I hope he inspired you today. I hope the Lord of God blessed you today. And we all can be challenged by this series, these messages, these people of God who have given us an example, and we can follow that example, and then we rise up and be people of faith like they were. Amen? Father, well, thank you for your word. Thank you for challenging us. Thank you for building us up and edifying this word. Thank you, Lord, for us letting us be able to see the life of Joseph and what an example he is. And may we all, with your help, the hope of the Holy Spirit within us, be able to see the big picture, to trust in you with all of our heart and not with our own understanding when we don't get what's going on, when the blaze of life happen, but to know that you have a great plan that you will work all things together for our good and we live according to your purpose when we're children of God. You will work things for our good. We believe that. We trust in you. We are you to bring good out of everything. And we just give you the praise, the glory, and the honor for it. In Jesus' name, amen.